Hey everybody, it is Richard Harris and Scott Lease. We are here for Surf and Sales for our podcast today. Another outstanding guest who we're super excited to have here is uh, Jason McComb. Home. And we're actually going to stop right there and we're going to say, Jason, how do we pronounce your last name? And apparently you've got a pretty good story about it too. So that was an intentional butcher, wasn't it, Richard? Yes, it was. Well, not really, actually. You did tell me right before we started, but I still butchered it because I'm just Richard. Yeah. Um, the last name is actually pronounced Macklehone. Macklehone. But a really, a really funny story. Um, a couple of years ago, I was back in New York. I'm now just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And we were having some, you know, beers with the family. It was my, my mom, my dad, my sister, my brothers, a couple of aunts and uncles. And we got way too deep in the uh, Budweiser. Uh, and about 10, 15 cans in, my mother goes, where in the world are you getting uh, all that appetite for, for beer, in particular alcohol? I said, well, it's got to be the Scottish blood. And she's like, oh, no. You're actually Irish Italian, so that actually explains it. <laughs> <laughs> so all your life, you thought you were Scottish. I, I, if I watch the movie Braveheart, it brings me to tears every single time. So I thought the M's is typically Scottish. Usually, you get the Irish is O'Reilly or O'Callaghan, right. but it, it was my love of beer and actually potatoes that go with that that I eventually <laughs> find out that I'm Irish Italian. That is hilarious. Well, before we go any further, let, let's uh, introduce you a little bit. We love to give context. We know we're not here to plug um, businesses, but you know, you were the company called Remote Sales. Uh, explain to people who are listening or watching what that means. Like, what 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 do you guys do as an organization so they understand as we have this conversation what your frame of reference is? Yeah, just to give everybody a really quick backdrop. I've been in sales my whole life, thirty years. Uh, I'll be 50 this coming April. I spent the first half of my career on Wall Street as a stockbroker. Most of that time, I lived in South Florida. We can talk about that in today's podcast. And then the second 12 plus years, I was at a company called Market Source, which is a division of Allegis Group, the largest staffing company in the United States. I actually ran the lead gen slash inside sales organization. Last year, about March, I said, you know what, I've done what I can do here. I'm getting a bit burned out. I'm going to leave the company and go start my own, my own uh, organization. That was in March. And I actually didn't come up with the name Remote Sales until about a week or two after I quit. I actually had no idea what I was going to do. So I was actually on the couch, which is right back behind me here, and I was thinking, all right, where am I going with this? And I started thinking about my time in South Florida, I had a big house in Delray Beach, overlooked the pool, the palm trees. It, it was living La Vida Loca. <laughs> and, I, and I started thinking about how much I loved working out of my house. And I did that for over seven years. And then you combine that with my love of sales, whether it was on Wall Street or running, you know, lead gen inside sales teams. And it was literally like a ticker tape across my forehead remote sales. So I said, holy shit. I went to my computer. I logged into register.com. I, I type in remote sales.com and there it is. It's for sale for 10 grand. So I was like, oh boy, I don't have 10 grand to blow. That's a heck of a lot of money for a domain. I wrestled with that for about a week. I ended up buying it from a guy out of Miami, Florida. About a month or so after that, um, remoteonline.com, which is the job board spun off. But, but in a nutshell, remote sales helps to recruit, train, deploy, and manage remote sales teams, primarily here in the U.S., but potentially in Canada and around the world. So companies might bring me in to consult. Uh, right now, we've got a project with a major commercial furniture company uh, where they've historically been digital marketing. They're now building an outbound campaign to go after you know new dealers as well as end users in a few various markets. So just think about you can sell anything from anywhere in 2020 and that's what Jason does. Yeah, there's so many different ways that <clears throat> I could follow up on that. Um, let me start here. I get asked all the time um, you know, for help from people who in particular nowadays are, are looking for work from home sales jobs, remote sales jobs. And the most common theme is 
I have no idea where to go find one of those jobs, right? Where, where do I go? Who do you know? Where can I get them? What, what advice do you have for those, those people? I mean, obviously that's part of why you do what, what you do, but how do people start just actively honing in and seeking those type of sales jobs specifically? Great question, Scott. Um, when we launched remote sales about eight, nine months ago, I had originally intended it, uh, the job board to be a subdomain of remote sales. But within days of me announcing that on LinkedIn, I had literally hundreds of people and still do. I get over 100 emails a week with the 40 plus thousand followers that I've been blessed to accumulate over the last two years. And it was disabled vets. It was single moms. It was pre-retirees. It was millennials that wanted to travel the world and, and work remotely, whether it was out of an Airbnb or a hotel. So that's when I came to the decision that, you know what, we need to have a separate domain and even a company because you can go to LinkedIn or Indeed or, or Monster and you're going to spend all day, if not all week, looking for remote jobs in your category. Yeah, so, you, I mean, you really got to hunt and, 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 and dig yeah. deep for those kind yeah. of... So what I did is I decided to form a partnership with ZipRecruiter. I could have done it with them or Indeed, where I give a fraction of my revenue in exchange for them supplying me with thousands of what they call backfill listings, meaning they've got remote jobs listed on Indeed, Monster, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and a hundred other boards across the, the world. In exchange for uh, a cut of the pie, if you will, they leverage my brand. So the fact that I've been blessed with over 40,000 followers in the fourth quarter of last year, we were doing over 2 million views a month, mostly with text posts. Um, as the brand continues to grow, I've kind of become a, a, an accumulator, if you will, in 20 different categories of remote work. So it's accounting, it's customer service, it's developers, it's healthcare, finance, sales, marketing, virtual assistants. So if you're a job seeker and you're looking to work either part-time or full-time remote, you can go to remoteonline.com. Right on the homepage, there's a search. You can do it by location, the category that you're interested in. Just make sure to enter remote sales or remote accounting, whatever it is that you're looking for. And you'll literally get 200 jobs pulled up instantly that you can peruse through and apply with a click of a button. How do you, how do you coach people to get around the objection? I mean, I, it, the objection still exists, even though I think it's um, dissipating a little bit. But like, oh, you can't trust salespeople to work remote, right? So how, how do you coach, if you coach, I assume you do, coach some of the candidates, you know, to, to, to handle that? Like, look, you're going after this kind of job. You're going to get asked this question. Here's how you should reply. Give, give, give us your best, your best rebuttal to that, right? Yeah. Well, the, the good news is about 43% of companies in the U.S., and it's actually more than that in Australia and the U.K., which are very remote friendly, but almost half of the companies in the United States have either a part-time or a full-time remote staff. They're flexible. So that's the good news. The bad news is 57% are still dead set against in many cases. But the beautiful the, the, thing that we've got flex, now, flex, Rich, The flex option is a lot more common now than full remote, I feel like. I feel like people are bending into the flex, still resistant to the full remote. Yeah, you agree? In, in some cases that is true. But when I was on Wall Street for 15 years, I spent half that time working out of a third bedroom in my house. The top 100 producers for the firm that I worked at were all remote. The main office was in California outside of LA. We were scattered all over the US and Canada. The firm I just came from, largest staffing company in the United States. So, what, so, here, so, so, so why, why, this is interesting. Why would, why do you think the Wall Street folks were open to it, but the supposedly hip, young, cool tech startups have been slower to adopt? Richard's over there making dollar bill signs. Dollar bill signs, man. It's all about Jason's going to come in and produce millions of dollars in fees. And he can dial it in from the moon or the sun if he wants, in my opinion. And I'm guessing that's probably part of it. Yeah. I also. Yeah. So, I what, what, go ahead. States have to be armed with our examples. I could go in and say, hey, I spent 
10 plus years on Wall Street, virtually everyone was remote. Our top producers were knocking down a million dollars a year. And here's how we did it. I spent 12 years at a staffing company. All of the top five producers were outside of Atlanta. We saw them once or twice a month. So if you're a job seeker and you're up against a, a company that's not remote friendly, you got to go in there with a specific example, ideally, of where you were, worked remote, what you produced, how often, if at all, that you were monitored, and whatever challenges you faced, how did you overcome them? But what's really starting to turn the tide right now is we are in the tightest job market in the history of our country. We've got 50 year lows in unemployment. We've got millions of open recs. I've had thousands that have been open for months at remoteonline.com. So C-suite executives that I talk to now, I've got, look, you have to get out of this. You must be within an hour of the office in order to apply for a job here. Yeah. That, that's because my question. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's the question that Scott said, which is how do you, you know, coach the, the, the individual, which I'm glad you gave that advice. Aside from the economy, you know, it's the economy stupid, right? What advice do we need to be giving to these leaders to understand that, A, you yeah. have to do it, but then more specifically, what tips can you give them to manage? Because what they're really afraid of is, I don't know how to manage somebody that way. Yeah. How do I, I do know. that? So what's your advice to the companies and the leaders who have to manage the remote employee? Right. Short of us spending all day talking about very simple stuff, such as instead of paying $100,000 a month in rent, you could have a much smaller flex space and spend, and spend say, $200,000 or $20,000 a month. Right. So you can not only pay your employees more, which is going to help with retention, but you can put more money in your own pocket. Great. Step but, one, that's good. What else? Yeah. So, so, but then it's all about the two Ps. I always talk about this. You got to play by the rules and you got to produce. If I'm the employer, I've got one page contract with no more than 10 rules that you need to follow as a remote worker. You know, no getting drunk, don't do drugs, don't disparage the company, et cetera. Then you got to produce. You got to hit a quota or a KPI that both you and I agree is fair. So if you're an employer who's new to remote work or you're dead set against it, my advice is very simple. Take some of your top people and give them one day to work from home. And you hand them one sheet of paper. You say, here are the 10 rules that Jason just gave me. And I agree with them. And you better hit your KPI, whatever that number happens to be. If you do, if you miss either, you're no longer working remote. And you might even be out of a job. And that's the way it should be. And what more and more companies are starting, Scott, is when we let our top producers work from home or a coffee shop, or in some cases, travel the world, they play by the rules and they produce, then one day turns to two. Two days turn to four. So if you're, if you're not willing to give it a shot with all the evidence out there, higher pay, better morale, lower attrition, cleaner air and water, I can't help you. But if you're willing to take an experiment with your top producers, those that you trust the most, and just give them one day, and if they play by the rules and they produce, that develops a level of trust between leadership and the, the remote workforce, and it expands from there. That's awesome. I'm literally taking notes because I want to talk about this as we, as we come up with a brief about it. But that's I'll awesome. give you another example that coincides yeah. with that. Let's say you've got kids. Right. Yes. They want to go to the movies uh, and take the car for the first time. Well, instead of handing over the keys and sending them you know, down the street at 10 o'clock at night, you might say, right, I'll tell you what. You go down the road and get some groceries for your mother. And you get your ass back here in 30 minutes without a single scratch on that car. You do that, then I will- Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's, it's, you got to give you know, baby steps. We got we to gotta crawl, walk, and then run. But once your children, your grandkids, or your employees demonstrate that they can be trusted to play by the rules and produce, then Katie bar the door. And what really, you know, money talks. Everybody knows that. When, when an employer realizes that I can pay my employees more, I can actually charge my customers less because my rent, my overhead is way down. And then, oh, by the way, I've got the kicker is, as we pull vehicles off the road, we end up cleaning up the air and the water for my grandkids that I adore so much. The green light comes on and that's why the tide's turning. And, I, and you know, Forbes just had an article. 
Yeah. Within five years, more remote workers will outnumber office workers for the first time in U.S. history. It's scary in the real estate market, that's for sure. <laughs> what, they, what they'll you, find a, I'm sure they'll find a way to adjust. Yeah. Um, <laughs> aside from what you said is a little bit, we, we like to talk a little bit about the origin story, right? And you talked about a couple of the jobs you had, but way back when, you know, what was, what was Jason like? What made Jason kind of go, I want to be in sales. I like sales. You know, you know, there are not a lot of sales degrees out there, right? Um, yeah. Where's that coming from? Yeah. Um, I was a three-sport athlete. I played baseball, basketball, football, and I was fortunate to be a captain. I was a pitcher and a quarterback of my team. I ended up playing football through college. So that's kind of a, a leadership risk-taking role. So when I graduated, you know, in 1992 from St. Lawrence University, a big hockey school in New York, you know, it, it was normal for me to want to acclimate towards a career that had unlimited potential, uh, a risk-taking environment that you get what you put into it. And I literally, there's a, here's a story I'll try and say, a five-minute story that I could tell you two days worth. It was May of 1994. My sister just graduated college. She said, hey, we're going to Pompano Beach, Florida with her then boyfriend, eventually became husband. You want to go? Well, I was at the time working at MetLife selling life insurance of all things door to door. And I said, you know what? I need to get out of this industry. It's just not for me. So we jumped in a car in a 1988 Red LeBaron. We got off at Daytona Beach for a few months of, of partying. And eventually made it to an apartment in Papua Beach, months? Florida. Yes, a few he, months? Yes, he a said few months. months. A few months of party. <laughs> Daytona Beach, if you've ever been there, at least it was 20 years ago, is a hell of a lot of fun. Of what I can remember of it, actually. <laughs> so I remember getting off an exit in Pompano Beach. It was a Tuesday. We got an apartment, and I went to a place called the Baja Beach Club. And as sure as I'm sitting here with you guys today, I go into the bar and there's a guy over to my left who had a Versace, a silk Versace shirt and a big fat Rolex. And he's watching me, you know, entertain a couple of airline stewardesses from American Airlines, actually. And he's like, man, you got a gift to gab. Uh, you know, what are you doing? I said, well, I just got here from Daytona Beach. I, have, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. This is my first day in town. He ends up saying, come and see me. It was in the Bank of America building in Fort Lauderdale on the 18th floor. I ended up talking my way in as a, as a, a junior broker, got my Series 7, and, and the rest wow. within six months was history. What a great – that's a great story. That's fantastic. Great story. That's How, really, really fun. <clears throat> so you, you have you – have clear. my favorite part of this conversation, by the way, is I'm finally talking to two people who are older than me, which is fantastic. I feel like, you know, 42 <laughs> years old, I'm starting to be a dinosaur. So this is – I love this. You guys predate me. This is great. So, and you're a hell of a lot better surfer than I am, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, you're selling in Wall Street. There's certainly a particular stereotype and, and stigma there about, uh, you know, from Boiler Room and Wall Street movie and whatever, like how those kind of sales are made and the approach. How has your approach and your actual selling evolved and changed over the years from, you know, that industry and what you're doing then to how you sell uh, you know, now? That's, that's an awesome question. And I've, I've mentioned this in other podcasts with Rob Jepson and Gabe Larson, but if anybody listening saw the movie Wolf on Wall Street, I actually knew Leo DiCaprio's character in real life, uh, Jordan Belfort. He was the head of Strat Notma in New York, and there were a number of sister companies, one of which was Biltmore Securities in Fort Lauderdale. So I, as soon as I Shortly after I had gotten my Series 7, I walked into that place and ended up, I was there for about a month. You, work, you worked there? Yeah, I worked there. I didn't work in Jordan. He was in New York at Stratton and Bill yeah. Moore was in Fort Lauderdale. But they were closely aligned. They had, you know, trading desks that were buying and selling the same securities. If you saw the movie, by the way, I agree with everything that was in it except for the airline scene. I won't say it because it's a bit graphic, but if you remember the scene when they're on the plane having too much of a good time, that I do not agree with. But everything else that was in that movie was wow. the lifestyle I that I was exposed to. Wow. That's funny. 
But back back then, we were we were handed stacks of three four hundred Dun and Bradstreet cards, so it was smiling and dialing all day long. And you know, nineteen index, index cards, right? Like index yeah, cards. Yeah, the three by yeah. five index cards. Uh, we had a stack that we were given every single day, three four inches thick, and you pretty much had to be calling. We didn't leave voicemail back in those days, nonstop from about eight eight thirty until five six o'clock at night. And some guys would stay even longer to call the West Coast. But back then, this is pre-internet, you know, pre uh, do not call list, pre iPhone. We had about a twenty five percent connect rate, so we would talk to a lot of people back in the day. 20 Really, twenty five percent. Really? Yeah, you. We we Gosh, would get you know, twenty to twenty five percent. Am I um, am I am I dating myself as a as a as a child right now, Richard? I don't, Scott. I'm going to show you a rotary phone and see if you even know how to work it. I think yeah. I still remember. It. Yeah. Yeah. So so back in those days, we had we had good leads. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross leads where they were spending a fortune to get, you know, in many cases, direct lines to accredited investors at what you might call a fortune 1000 company. So we would call the CEO of Wendy's, Coke, Pepsi, McDonald's, um, and probably cut it off at about a billion dollars a year in revenue. So we were not going after the small fries. We were going after the big fish. So if you didn't directly get through the decision maker, you were definitely dialogue. And remember Bud Fox on wall street, you would definitely dialogue with the assistant or the admin back then who was in charge, you know, as the gatekeeper. But then you had the dot-com bubble burst in 2000. Everybody loses a fortune. The firms that I were at, including Biltmore, go out of business, um, whether it was the, you know, the SEC shutting them down or it was investments that were, they were way too over leveraged and they imploded. But that's when the, the consumer started to get a lot savvier than they are now. You had the do not call list that eventually evolves into the crash of 2008. Now you've got, the outlaw of robocalls, you've got GDPR. In 2020, it, it, if you're just smiling and dialing, you're in big effing trouble. And that's why you'll see, if you Google uh, call center closures, you'll see Comcast, AT&T, Verizon. They're shutting down call centers like crazy. And it's not just because of remote work, which is part of it, you know, real estate costs are less. It's not just the chat bots, which are definitely on the horizon. It's the fact that the consumer, the buyer in 2020, doesn't want to be called cold in most cases. And there's so much technology now to insulate them that if you're not calling, emailing, texting, social media, networking, direct mail, all the above, what I call multi-channel, you're in big trouble. Was that, was that difficult for you to evolve and change your, your, selling, uh, your selling style? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm curious because you, know, you said you've been in sales for 30 years or so, right? Right. So I'm thinking right now about the the folks who are early in their career and they're 25 years old right now. And this is the way they're selling right now, right? 30 years from now in the year 2050, I wonder how these folks will be selling and if it will be a difficult transition for them or a smooth transition. So what, what was it was it tricky for you? Did you feel like holy shit, there's all these new fandangled, you know, pieces of tech I got to adjust, I got to do all these different things or or was it you know, smooth and easy. Yeah. When you're young, you know, think back early nineties and you're in a pit as I was for, with two or 300, mostly men. And you're having a good time. Sometimes you're coming back from a three martini lunch. There's just all sorts of, uh, high energy. You wouldn't even conceive of doing business any other way than using the phone. But then you started to see, as I mentioned, you know, the dot-com bubble burst, the crash of 2008, which actually personally wiped me out. I went bankrupt, had to start all over again. It, it totally changed the landscape. And then everybody was given something about the same time called the iPhone. And now you've got iPhone where if you're not in someone's contact list, you're not even going to get through. It's going to get pushed to voicemail. So I was fortunate to answer your question, Scott, that when I was at my last firm, which is a division of the largest staffing company in the world, the only way that they could get a hold of the best talent the best candidates was through an all the above approach. You just couldn't call some coder in California to get a job filled. You might have to call them. You might have to text them. You might have to DM them on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. You may have to send them a letter. So it started to become obvious and it just kind of like, man, the writing's on the wall. If we don't change, 
we're in big trouble. And if I could just make this point before we go any further, we are, in my opinion, about to see the greatest transformation in the history of sales throughout this decade. And it's happening right now on LinkedIn. It's the last frontier as far as I'm concerned. You can, you can say what you want about TikTok. I'm not even sure that's going to last much longer. But you have two, 300% organic reach right now on LinkedIn. You can't even get one or 2% on any, Facebook, Twitter, any of those other places. So if you're listening to me right now and you're in sales or you're a young millennial Gen Xer, you must develop what we call a personal brand. And what is that? It's nothing more than talk about what you're passionate about. It could be anything. Ideally, you want it to be professionally oriented. And you've got three choices, really. You can write about it, you can speak about it as what you're doing now, or you can do video. The good news is if you'll do that because only 1% are, sky's the limit. You're gonna realize as I, Richard and Scott and others have, Jake Dunlop's another example, the business is gonna start coming to you. When you're generating one, two million views a month, the prospects start coming to you. It'll take you a year or two to get there, but it's absolutely possible. The bad news that, to that is, if you refuse, as the 99% do, to expose yourself to your colleagues, your boss, your customers, in a world that's going 5G, soon to be augmented reality, I think the phone personally, in terms of cold calling, is gonna be absolutely dead within five years. There's gonna be a multi-channel ecosystem. There's Jason's big, bold prediction from the show. Five years, you heard it. I'm telling you right, there's gonna be, I envision kind of like a beam me up Scotty platform. Uh, some even say there's gonna be telepathic communication, but let's say five years from now, and, and this is social media is where it's at, because you can already email a level one connection. Would not be surprised if they open that up to level two and level three. Anybody well, following you, you? If you have a premium enough account, you already can. Yeah, well, even for free, even for free, your level one connections, I don't know if people know this, but you can leave a one minute voicemail. Yeah. You take your cell phone, you got to do it on mobile. You go into their mailbox and you'll see a, a little microphone. You hit that and it allows you to leave a one minute voicemail. You can also see a little uh, photo icon where you can leave a one minute video that's encrypted. It can't be shared anybody anywhere else. I think they're eventually gonna incorporate FaceTime and texting. So in your privacy settings, you're gonna opt into, I'm willing to take a text, a FaceTime, but not a video, et cetera. And it's ultimately gonna put, you know, the pure play call centers and the phone companies out of business. All the power, in my opinion, is gonna be Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft by way of LinkedIn. But what about what about Instagram? Do you think that'll fit in there too? Yeah, I mean they're in, they're in a bit of a death match with TikTok. But I, you know, just see if I could offend some people out there. I don't think TikTok's going to make it, in large part because it's a Chinese-backed organization. The U.S. Yes. government just outlawed it. Some say they're tracking consumers in the United States by way of TikTok. So if that is true, it's never going to last. There's going to have to be a Western slash U.S. based short video platform that takes you know I mean, it's you, place. You, right you, someone's you gonna made, buy it if they you have made, to you it, made right? a great point a great point in my opinion about you know how important linkedin is and, and there's so much chatter about personal branding and that kind of thing but um you know i i, I wish we could reframe the phrase personal branding a little bit i, I don't know that i'm branding myself. I think what I'm doing for myself is creating employment security. I had this conversation and I made this post a while ago about the difference between job security versus employment security, right? I, I, I'm doing all of this stuff that I'm doing to get my word out there, you know, my message, my thought process, my sales methodology, my coaching, trainings, whatever you want to call it, clients, right? That will ensure, in my opinion, that if I fail on my solopreneur journey here, enough people will know who I am that I will be hireable like that, right? Exactly. And, and it's employment security to me that, that, is, that is what matters, you know? Nobody has job security really anymore, right? That, that's, that, that's a, my dad has given me shit for you know, the last 15 years, he's been an accounting professor at Chico State University in California for 40 something years now. 
he doesn't understand the startup world. He doesn't understand the sales world. He thinks I'm nuts for, you know, going into sales and even worse sales leadership where like my head is on the, you know, chopping block all the time. Yeah. It's not about job security to me, right? It's somebody somewhere is going to need something sold, right? And so how do I do, how do I create action and momentum so people somewhere know who I am and might think that I might be able to help them in their organization, whether it's as a, a leader, as an individual contributor, or, or, or what have you. And, and you're, you know, you're dead right. You know, people out there listening to Jason, Jason's talking about how he gets, you know, he's got 40,000 something followers, you know, million, two million views every single month. I got, I got the same thing. This is not, this is not hyperbole, you know, and I haven't gone in and done the, the math and tracked it all as my, my buddy Kevin Dorsey gives me grief about that I should be doing. But I know, I know the number's good enough to know that I'm in those. And my business comes from LinkedIn, whether that's yeah. my second sales business, my consulting business, all of it. This is, this is real, real talk. So I, I hope, I hope people are thinking about that and, uh, and taking it to heart. Yeah, you make, you make such a number of amazing points there, Scott. I want to hone in on one. Um, a good friend of mine, you guys might be connected, to Jake Dunlap, CEO at Scale. Yeah. yeah very forward-thinking, cutting-edge guy. He is constantly talking about, we need to get away from this concept of what's called social selling and start talking more about social engagement. And I'm so aligned with that from what just Scott just said, because here's the news, folks. I may have 40,000 followers. I might be doing 2 million views a month, but I'm making very little money. Let me say that again. Very little money from all that traffic. The reason is, to Scott's point, I'm making an investment now of my time, my experience, my passion, my resources. Because I know as the months and the quarters and the years go by, because again, and this number has been consistent for 10 years. Only 1% of social media creates content. So if you want to be in the top 1% for those that are listening, even if you're scared to death like everybody else was, even if you think you got a face for radio like I know I do, or maybe Richard does as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just grateful you both left me out of that. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to take an effort right now to take baby steps. And what I recommend to a lot of people is start with engaging in other people's content. Set aside an hour a day. And I would actually, if I was a, you know, if you're a VP of sales out there, instead of having nothing but call blocks, you know, all right, from 10 to 11, we're going to make cold calls. How about an hour long of social media? I oh, want you. That's to brilliant. Hour. That's really good. Really good yeah, advice. Yeah. For the next hour, hour and a half on LinkedIn. And if you're LinkedIn marketing. Blitz. A LinkedIn Twitter, blitz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I don't want to see any sales ads. I don't want to see any, hey, can I get 15 minutes? I don't, want to, I don't want to see any of that bullshit. I want you to genuinely compliment folks like Richard, who puts out a, little, a lot of great content, Scott. Tell them what you like about the blog or the video. One or two sentences is all you need. Do that 10, 15, 20, 30 times a day. Once you start to get your name out there, your following will start to increase because buyers, recruiters, bosses will say, wow, that Sally keeps sharing very thoughtful feedback on content. I want her on my team. And to Scott's point, that's job security. So the more you're out there, whether you're engaging in other content or preferably in addition to that, creating your own content, you're going to have recruiters. I've got thousands of recruiters that still reach, hey, are you interested in it? No, I've moved on, but I appreciate that. How are they hearing me or, or getting back to me? they see me posting content or they see me on a podcast like this. So if you want job security, if you want decision makers to reach out to you, if you want recruiters knocking down your door, you got to get into this, what we're now calling personal branding, but maybe we should call it social engagement. I would, the only thing I would add to that, Jason, is that um, do everything Jason said, but you don't always have to agree. Like I like yeah. it when people take a different frame of reference from yeah. me. Um, I, I, I always compliment people when they say, hey, Richard, I disagree with you. And I'm like, hey, great. Thanks for disagreeing. Nobody ever does. Let's make this more interesting because the comments are always the fun parts of threads, right? So, hey, I love a different point of view. So by all means, you know, do it politely. Don't, don't, you know, don't be a troll and say, hey, I'm not sure I see it that way. Maybe what am I missing? What do I understand? What am I not understanding? So by all means, I think that's fantastic 
fantastic advice. Yeah, you know, to Richard's point, you know, I always talk about 80-20 rule. Yeah. If you're putting out really, really good content and there's a bit of, you know, like if you put out something like cold calling is dead, you're definitely going to get some critics, what yeah. some people call haters. But what you have to realize, to Richard's point, is when people disagree, that's what creates viral activity. If everybody's saying, oh, Jason, you're the greatest, you know, Scott, I've never heard anything better than that. It's not going anywhere. Yep. You want as much as 20% of the people to say, yeah, I don't think so. What most people will do on LinkedIn because it's their real name, they'll be respectful. You know, they'll say, hey, Richard, I respectfully disagree and here's why. Yep. Because it's, it's their brand that's at stake if they act like an ass. Yep. But every once in a while, you will get someone who's nasty. And I would strongly encourage everybody, don't block them. I know there's a lot of people that disagree with that. Don't block them. I disagree with that. <laughs> Either ignore them. Or what I love to say are three words. Appreciate the feedback. Because a lot of times, you got somebody who's in a bad mood and they're just looking for a fight. Like Richard came after me a couple of months ago when he had a slow October. I forget what he said to me in a DM. But he eventually confessed that he was just looking to scrap. And I knew that all along. <laughs> but it came because directly. I, I love Richard. But you have to be able to take the slings and arrows. But that was, but that was I, privately, right? Or was that publicly? What's that? Was that publicly or privately, though? It was privately. It was privately. You know, there, know. Other, people, other people probably would have said, hey, look what Richard said to me in this DM. You know how you see people throw yeah. those screenshots? I, 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 I only slightly disagree with you. You know, I... Uh, Maybe, maybe it's me. I, I get a, a decent number of, you know, people who write stuff like, who the fuck are you being saying this and having, you know, this kind of take and whatnot. And my personal view is I don't have time in my life for that shit. Yeah. I'm, you don't deserve a, yes, I should probably ignore you. And 99.9% .9 of the time I do ignore you, but uh, I don't have time to engage you. You don't, you don't get three words of appreciate the feedback from me. Yes. And, and if it was nasty enough, you just get automatic block. You know, you know see ya, hit the bricks, right? It's certainly your prerogative. I'll, 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 tell you, I'll tell you how this originated really quick. I used to have a, a website where I had a, almost a million followers on Facebook. And I got to where on the website, which was like a social network, I, I started blocking IP addresses of troublemakers. And it eventually got so bad that the real big troublemakers were very savvy with proxy servers. So I got to where I had packages come into my house. I had, you know, envelopes showing up in the mailbox because I blocked way too many psychopaths. So ever since then, I said, you know what? If someone's going to take a cheap shot, I'm either going to ignore them and I'm only using the block as a last resort because if you block the wrong people, they're going to make it their mission in life to destroy Scott's day. Now Jason's Jace got me paranoid now. I'm going to go into my, my account and unblock everyone. So here's, here's, here's the only thing, you know, Scott, instead of saying appreciate the feedback, you know, because you're in Texas and, and Jason, you're in the South and I grew up in Macon, so uh, Macon, Georgia, so I, I got it, is you could just say, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> it, all, it all means the same that's the, thing. That's the, that's the perfect feedback. Oh, bless your heart. <laughs> so, uh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Um, so Jason, let's shift a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about sales and marketing. And, I, and then I know we got to sort of wrap it up, but um, in your world, right? We, we've had this conversation with a few people around the, the shrinking delineation between sales and marketing, right? Um, and I'm just curious in your world, in your experience, how do you see that? And it's, it may be completely irrelevant to what you're doing, but you are talking a lot about marketing in your way, in ways when you talk about this, the social engagement stuff, it's a, it's social engagement is marketing, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just curious, do you see those roles starting to merge together as you work with clients? How are they approaching it with you? What are they saying to you? Yeah, that's such an awesome question, uh, Richard. I, I see it merging to such an extent where you could actually make the case that marketing as we've known it is going to disappear. I don't know what we're going to call it in the next five years and beyond, but this you know, download our white paper, uh, sign up for this webinar, all this in your face outbound quote marketing material that we've grown up on over the last 10 or 20 years, that's out. What's in right now is when you share a podcast or you share a video 
whether it's at a show or you're sitting in your backyard and you're talking about a subject that the audience cares about and that you ask for feedback. You know, some of the most, the, the, the biggest conversions right now on YouTube video ads are uh, interviews or testimonials from satisfied customers. Well, that's not a download this white paper. That's not a sign up for this webinar. This is, you know, Sally talking about how she brought, bought a product or a service from Richard and it changed her life. And Sally is now selling or marketing Richard's products and services and he just has to sit back and answer the phone. So the world that we're now morphing into is a very socially engaged environment where sales and marketing is coming together. This whole, you know, this notion of, well, those leads suck. You know, sales has said that for millennia. That's over. It's, it's in the last bottom of the eighth, top of the ninth inning. It's now going to be, we now need to consider ourselves a media company. Some people call it copywriting. We got to be cranking out, you know, podcasts, texts, photos, etc., where we can create conversation points. We can get the community to engage and give us their feedback and their opinion. Meaning each employee becomes their own media company. Exactly. You know, you've seen Gary Vaynerchuk talk about that nonstop. You've got, you know, other folks, uh, you know, I know the guys over at Sales for Life are talking about the same thing. You need to stop thinking about yourself as a salesperson first, which is going to be very, very hard. And you're actually a media company first. You're, you're, you've got to get yourself and what we now call our brand out there. It's funny. And we what, just, we just had this conversation with Jack Kuzikowski, right? We just released that. Uh, love Jack. Ago. And, uh, and that's exactly what he said. He said, look, I went to my boss, this is years ago and said, I'm not going to call. I'm not going to do this. I'm going to take this social approach. And he's, and he's seen, he's seen as sort of the, a leader in the social selling realm. And, uh, and I think what you just said, I mean, enough people are saying it and they're doing it. And he, and he said, you know, his boss gave him a month to do it. And he said, and he came back in a month and he was the number one salesperson. And then yeah. the boss was a little shocked because they're like, well, shit, what do I do now? Uh, what do I tell all my other sales reps? And all of a sudden Jack now became, you know, became the top rep in the company and all this kind of stuff. So, I mean, you're just, you're, you are reconfirming what I think a lot of people are saying in the back of their mind and they're refusing to give up the old school ways. So it's really, yeah. And you know, I love Jack and I, he, he constantly talks about your objective ultimately is to get the conversation offline, yeah. whether that's a phone call or a cup of coffee down the street. So when you're engaging with the community, when you're putting out your own content without any sales ask whatsoever, you're trying to establish thought leadership. You're trying to be perceived as an expert or someone who's passionate about a particular niche. Yep. And why it's very, very important to have your profile on LinkedIn in particular optimized. You gotta have a decent photo, a headline that speaks to what you do. Your summary needs to talk to the buyer or the prospects that you're looking to serve. It's gotta be keyword word rich. So that as the audience on LinkedIn and other social networks apply, as they fall in love with you, the person, and you, the content creator, it's a natural inclination to go, gee, I wonder what Richard or Scott do. So yes. they wander on over to your profile on their time, not yours. A cold call, you're waking somebody up out of a stupor to, to try and get a 15-minute demo. When you are creating content on LinkedIn, you give the buyer a chance, whether it's when the kids are to bed or it's on a weekend, you know, I've been seeing a lot of good stuff from Scott and Richard. I'm going to go over to their profile now and go, hmm, wow, it looks like they solve a problem that I currently have. And before you know it, somebody's getting a DM. Hey, Richard, I saw a podcast that you did with Scott. You guys were talking about A, B, and C. I'm actually struggling with that problem. Is there any way we can get on a call? And boom, it's now offline, which is, you know, in my opinion, and perhaps you guys as well, that's where we're going, folks. If you're a smiler and dialer like I was for many, many years, you're doomed. You're going to be a dinosaur. You're going to be out of business. You've got to get into a multi-channel cadence that's got, you know, text, phone, social, et cetera. And it really, really is becoming painfully obvious that if you're not part of the 1%, and by the way, it's been constant for 10 years, I don't think there's going to be any more than that. For everyone that jumps in, the haters scare out another one. So if you want to be at the top of your, you know, your career, your industry, start talking about what you're passionate about and the buyers will eventually, not right away, but eventually come to you. Jason, I think next time we have you, um, you've got to stand up 
and I, I want to I want to put a gospel choir behind you. Um, the, <laughs> Great. It's, it's fantastic, man. It's really, 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 really. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this has been awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Let's, uh, let's turn it around a little bit here. We, uh, how can we help you? What is something that, you know, we could do to, to support you and your efforts and your business or, you know, any, any questions that, that you have that maybe you've been wanting to, to, to ask us while you got us here right now? Um, yeah, any, I, I appreciate kind of that. I look forward to hearing about surf and sales and promoting that. I know you got one coming up at the end of February. But as I mentioned, I just started my own company less than a year ago. We had our first you know, client that was a commercial furniture company. That project may be coming to an end. So if I was to ask for help, it would be from you guys and those who might be watching. If you need help standing up an inside and or remote sales team, if you need help around email marketing, cold calling, and what we now call social selling or social engagement, reach out to me. I've been in the business a long time. I don't have all the answers, but I am fortunate to have, you know, a fairly decent platform on, on LinkedIn. And to all the job seekers that are out there, I created remoteonline.com to become the number one remote work job site. All we do is serve remote work in 20 different categories. It is 100% free. I make a little bit of money on traffic, and if an employer decides to invest 150 bucks a month to post an ad, but if you're somebody looking for work, part-time, full-time, freelance, or temp, go sign up at remoteonline.com, create a free profile, upload your resume, and sign up for job alerts. It's free, it always has been, and it always will be. And if you've got any questions on how to navigate that world, you can reach me at jason at remotesales.com or for the job board, it's jason at remoteonline.com. Man, Got that's it. awesome, Jason. Thank you so much. And and so I want to hear before we end this. Yeah. Uh, what's this? I saw all these pictures last year, and it looked awesome. What is Surf and Sales, and and how can I help promote what's coming up here at the end of February? Well, you can help promote it right now, this very moment, by agreeing to come, because we know that it's <laughs> in there. We'll get. get a, so, you know, so hire Jason as as my my hype man. Exactly. Do I, do I manage the bar? Uh, because, you know, unless you guys, unless you guys want to see me in the water more than I'm on the surfboard, that's the way it's going to be. Uh, you know, you know, Jason, it, it was, it was created as an alternative to the, you know, mega conference, right? It, it basically, you know, Richard and I were with our families in Costa Rica on vacation and, and I was kind of, we were out in the water surfing and I was kind of giving Richard some, some, some grief because, you know, for what he's done for the last, eight years now, Richard, something like that. About seven. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. You know, he's traveling all over the place and he's always going to this conference and that thing. And, you know, I'm like, dude, every conference you go to is at like the Marriott in, you know, St. Louis, like so boring, no disrespect to St. Louis. It's just the same thing, right? Like how come nobody does a conference in a killer place like, like Costa Rica? And why does there have to be thousands upon thousands of people? Why is it bigger, 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 right? Why is it not just small, intimate, more powerful, stronger networking, right? Longer opportunity to engage people about what you do and potentially, you know, get customers. We've had people recruit each other away from different jobs, you know, and it's about getting out of your comfort zone and combining a learning, uh, a learning week and, a, and sales sessions, management sessions, you know, leadership sessions, all this kind of stuff with a little bit of a vacation, you know? It's, it, it, it's pretty hard to be, you know, spending four or five days literally in houses 30 yards from the water. I mean, it's on the water, right? We hire locals to come in and cook for us really good local food. We hire locals to teach people how to surf who don't know how. And 90% of the people who go don't know how to surf, right? So that, that, that was, that was the, the, the purpose of it is, is to create this kind of micro-conference alternative and, and this movement away from larger, 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 right? I, 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 I would love to see us go back to, you know, more intimate, more powerful kind of experiences. So that, that's why I, that's I, don't, I don't want them to do that because then it'll make it harder for ours to be so successful, right? Like, <laughs> you know, we're doing, we're doing our fourth one in two and a half years. And, uh, and well, competition is the sincerest form of flattery, right? Yeah, but you know, um, <laughs> 
It reminds me of the old, the old saying, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Yeah. I can remember when I was a kid, it was all about, hey, mom, I'm going to go down the street and build a snowman with Joey and Stevie. Okay, son, go have a great time. Fast forward now, it's all about gaming with millions of kids all over the world at the same time. I would not be surprised, Scott, if as the world spirals out of control with AI and whatever the hell comes next, there's a thirst and a desire for people to get together in smaller groups. And, you know, I've never been to Costa Rica, but I hear it's like a bucket list place. Yeah, so it is. I, I think you're definitely onto something. And who knows, maybe I'll crash the party. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to have you, man. We'd love to have you. Thanks again for spending some time with us, Jason. Best of luck to you this year and uh, stay in touch, man. Yep. All right, guys. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Jason. We really appreciate it. It was awesome okay. chatting with you. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.